We going? Okay. Excuse me, everybody. It's uh, high noon, so we're going to get the program going. My name is Corey Levinson. I'm Military Medical Innovation Director, working with the San Antonio Economic Development Corporation. I want to welcome you to this third in a series of three free event symposiums that are being hosted by Velocity Texas, our partners in putting on the Military Medical Industry Day, which will take place at the Gonzalez Convention Center on April 19th, which I hope you're all going to attend. And these events are intended to really be sort of teasers to give you an idea of what you can expect to learn more about if you come to the meeting next month, which I hope you will. The, um, the topic for today's uh, symposium is Tales from the Field. And we have some great panelists. There's one panelist here, here with me today, and then we have three additional panelists who are, are virtually with us. And uh, before I get into introducing the panelists and the, and the actual um, the meat of the discussion, I want to remind everybody that we're going to be recording today. I hope nobody will object to that. And uh, so this will be posted on the City of San Antonio's YouTube channel eventually. And as I said, uh, Velocity Texas is our co-host and uh, helping us with this event. I want to introduce David Fonseca, who's going to say a few words about Velocity before I Thank you, Corey. Thank you so much for being here today. We have around 29 people joining us online. For the folks online, we actually have around 16 people here. And it's great to see the collaboration that we have been able to achieve with Scott and, and Corey on, on these fronts. Uh, I would like to remind you guys that this Thursday, and okay, if I can get the slides working, we're going to have a fiesta uh, with Velocity. It's an event that, that we're hosting here 4 to 6 p.m. It's meant to be a networking event. We're going to serve you know, some beer, some wine, some food. But most importantly, Corey is going to be telling you guys more about the Military Medicine Industry Day. I'm, I'm part of the Health Sales Board of Directors. and They're having the state of the industry, and they're going to be promoting it. So if you guys want to learn more about that, we'll be happy to have you in there. Next one, Caitlin. Uh, as part of this initiative that we have with Scott and, and Corey, we thought that we should have a reception day at the end of the evening, the military industry day. So after that event happens, we would like to host you guys here. So if you guys have any friends or any attendees on that event and would like to come, I think that'd be a great way to have a networking event. Uh, the incubator program is here. This facility is 17,000 square footage, it's state of the art. We have offices fully furnished with conference rooms. And McKenna is working really hard to actually build some BSL2 labs space for you guys. And last time that I was here, I told you guys we're fully booked. We actually have a couple of more offices. So if you guys have an interest and you know startups that are in the biospace, medical device or health IT, we'd love to talk to them. We actually have limited space. And right now we have some, some room for, for some companies. And last but not least, one of the signature events that we host is called the BioGlobal Accelerator Program. We're sourcing companies from five different countries and we bring them to San Antonio and we try to scale them up through a six week process that is gonna happen in September and in October. Applications are, are gonna be opening April 4th, which is next Monday, and they're gonna be closed on May 18th. During these six weeks, they're gonna experience uh, over 20 sessions in business and technical uh, expertise with, with a whole bunch of uh, different organizations here in town. Uh, we're gonna culminate the event with a demo day, and demo day is gonna be in October. We haven't announced where it's going to be, but it's going to be a very special event. So if you guys know anything about accelerators, it's a very highly competitive way to bring companies together in a cohort uh, base. And, and uh, we're looking at seeking probably the top five applicants around five different countries. Last year, we received over 140 applicants and we selected six. So if you guys know startups that have an interest in, in scaling in the United States here in San Antonio, this is the program to be. With that, uh, thank you so much, Corey. And, and again, a pleasure to be with you guys here too. Okay. Um, thank you, David. So the topic for today's panel is tales from the field. And what we're really hoping to do today is bring together uh, four panelists who um, are in the private sector and are at companies that um, have in the past and are currently working with the military to bring to the market products and services that would be of use in the military. So we're hoping that they will share with you today basically the good, the bad, and the ugly. We've told them that we don't want to hear about all the great things. We want to hear about the challenges. And finally, um, we want to hear what their words of advice would be for anybody else who's on the call today that's thinking of working with the military who may not be at this point. So the way it's going to run, we have an hour. Um, Caitlin is going to, we're going to stop at about 10 minutes to one so we can take questions from people in the room or people online. 
Um, and with that, I'm going to, uh, I think, introduce the panelists. I'll go in alphabetical order. Hopefully, we can see them here. We have um, Andrew Borofsky, JD, who is the CEO at RevMedics. We have uh, Ross, Doc, Dr. Ross Donaldson, MD, who's uh, at Critical Innovations. We have Rebecca McMahon, PhD, MBA, who is the president of Rochelle Technologies, which is here in San Antonio. We have Dr. Stephen Bentichigwe, who is the co-founder of uh, Olafan Medical, which actually has offices in this building, and uh, Terrence O'Neill. <laughs> He's not on my list. But uh, I think I'm going to go in uh, alphabetical order here and maybe just start with the first question. Um, Andrew Borowski, I'm going to ask you maybe to say a few words about your company, um, what it is that your company is making for the military, and um, we'll just go through the line, just give everybody a little bit of an idea of, of who you are at, at each of these companies and, and what your experience briefly has been with the military. We'll get into deeper questions as we go into it. Well, thank you. Thank you, Corey. And thank you, everybody. Um, it's an honor to be here and, and uh, uh, share some stories and some, um, uh, you know, experiences in the medical device translation commercialization space. Uh, my name is Andrew Borofsky. I'm the co-founder and the CEO of a company called RevMedics Inc. Um, we were founded about, mm, time, time ticks on, it's, it's been about uh, 12 or so years ago. Uh, with the specific intent to commercialize uh, a new technology for stopping non-compressible junctional hemorrhage on the battlefield. Uh, that device is uh, uh, something called XSTAT. If you're interested in, in you know, pictures of it or sort of seeing uh, some background information on it, just go to Google and type XSTAT. You'll, you'll come up with a lot of information. Uh, but uh, you know, prior to forming the company, uh, we were approached by the US Special Forces to address um, a type of hemorrhage that was uh, um, you know, you know, occurring relatively frequently on the battlefield and didn't have any real capabilities to address. Um, and that's uh, non-compressible hemorrhage and more specifically junctional hemorrhage. And so that's bleeding uh, uh, primarily in the shoulder and the groin region. Um, and the, the hallmark of that bleeding or the challenge with that, those types of injuries is that they can be very narrow entrance wounds, they can be deep in the body, and uh, it's very difficult to apply uh, or approach that type of intervention at the traditional wound dressing. It, it's basically hard to pack those wounds and get any kind of hemostatic dressing or traditional -like dressing into the wound. Um, they're not in a place where you can apply a tourniquet. And so, uh, really a significant capability gap identified um, pretty broadly across the military and the different branches. But again, um, we were working with special forces who were you know, seeing some real challenges with that. So um, we uh, uh, ended up taking on some pilot research grants and over the course of about five years, we're able to go from a problem statement to a cleared medical device, uh, uh, commercially produced and delivered to the battlefield. Thank you. Um, I guess Dr. Donaldson, you're next in alphabetical order, if you would. Great, well, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, my name's Ross Donaldson. Um, I'm an emergency physician by background, still practice um, one day a week uh, here in Los Angeles, one of our main trauma centers. Um, and I'm president and CEO of Critical Innovations. Um, we're a company um, that does primarily um, R&D work for the Department of Defense, um, mostly in the trauma space. Um, we have had, I think at this point, over 30 different um, awards and contracts uh, on uh, several different medical technologies ranging from um, traumatic brain injury to a series of different foam devices, um, things to stop non-compressible hemorrhage. Um, and have had really good interactions with the Department of Defense, um, many of which is uh, based uh, uh, where you guys are in San Antonio. So um, you're definitely at the heart of uh, where military medicine is. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here. Dr. McMahon. Yes, I'm Rebecca McMahon. I'm the president of Rochelle Tech here in San Antonio. We're the research and development arm of Sonera MedTech, which is out of Fort Worth. Um, we're a small uh, company that works mainly in wound care and surgical support. 
Um, our military applications are with our Biocos line, which are an antimicrobial wound cleanser and an antimicrobial wound gel. Okay, thank you. Dr. Bente Chingwe. Thank you, Corey, and uh, thank you, David, for having me today. I'm, uh, I'm Stephen Achinkwe. I'm an anesthesiologist and critical care physician here in San Antonio, and uh, I'm the co-founder and chief medical officer at Oliphant Medical, and we have, we have developed an uh, endotracheal innovation stylet, a procedural hood for, to protect healthcare providers uh, during intubation uh, for COVID-19, and we're currently developing a novel nasal pharyngeal airway uh, for the military. And all of this has been basically grant funded. We funded through some Army X-Tech search grants and the other two technologies have been SBIR funded. And we brought our COVID innovating hood to the market briefly and, um, and uh, happy to be here and talk about all this. Well, thank you. Um, I guess, you know, we've got introductions made. Now. I'm, I'm sure people in this room would be interested in hearing about how you got involved with developing products or services for the military, whether that was something that uh, arose because you yourself as a, you know, somebody in the company was in the military and saw the need or whether uh, you were approached by the military that they wanted you to develop something for them or how do people find out what those needs are that the military medical community has so you can really start to um, address what they might be. And I guess I'll just open that to anybody that wants to, to, to initiate a comment. Well, I can jump in. Um, we have several uh, people in our company who are affiliated with the military, uh, retired Lieutenant Colonel, um, someone who is in the Air Force TACP, um, and actually my spouse is military. So um, we got involved when a military physician reached out to us to do a collaborative grant here in San Antonio. And um, once we had that contact, we started using that relationship to try to get more DOD funding. So that's how we started. Um, and I think that one of our strengths is the military members in our, our company. Um, they help us identify how we are uniquely uh, capable of fulfilling, or I guess, uh, you know, fulfilling the needs of the military. I'm sure others have different experiences and perhaps you'd like to share. Uh, I can go. Um, I think similarly, um, I was never in the military, but um, I did spend uh, five years as a humanitarian aid worker in Iraq, working primarily with the military and coalition forces there. Um, and I think similar to other people had some initial ideas um, that started through interactions directly with the, the military and needs on the on the field, um, and then came back and um, started finding the difficult path of how to how to get uh, funding um, to uh, move those devices forward. Well, for, for me, I was retired from the Air Force uh, position in the Air Force, and I recognize that a lot of the challenges we face, you know, in regular civilian medical practice you know, are shared by, of course, in the military medical world, but they're sort of amplified and magnified given the, you know, the, the constraints of the of operational medicine. So any challenges we face in the hospital are 10x more difficult to deal with in the field. So we felt like our technologies were sort of aligned with that, that they were sort of leveraging and lowered, sort of lowered the skill bar, which is kind of a goal of ours is to really lower the skill bar for the sort of independent providers in the field. So it just seemed like a really good connection. And, and, and they, we found that in fact, they did resonate with uh, military end users. Yeah, I mean, my connections actually through my relationship with uh, our company's co-founder, uh, Dr. Kenton Gregory, who is a physician scientist who's been working with the military on the military awards uh, across a whole spectrum of different technologies from photo medicine to tissue regeneration to hemorrhage control uh, over, gosh, it's been 30 plus year career. And so uh, once those relationships are built and, and you show that you're uh, you know, a proven performer and, and, and can deliver results, um, generally speaking, it's, it's a people game and, and uh, beginning to create that network and community with uh, military collaborators uh, you know, usually strengthens that and one project leads to another. <clears throat> I get in my position approached by a number of companies that have products that are perhaps for a civilian 
market and they want to know if there's an interest on the military side for it. So they're trying to basically push the technology onto the military medical side. But you know what I frequently hear from the military medical side is that doesn't work as well as becoming aware of what the needs are in the military medical side and then coming forward to say, you know, we have something that can, can address this need that we know you have. So, you know, I, I wonder if y'all could comment on what's the best way or an effective way for people in the private sector to learn about what those needs are so that they can think about whether or not anything that they have in their repertoire might address some of those needs and then begin to look for potential collaborations and find funding to move forward. Go, uh, Andrew, since you're being. Sure, I think I, I think this is a uh, um, one of the you know the biggest challenges at least getting started is sort of this matching up a um, a capability with a capability gap, and so I, I would certainly suggest that one um, listen, 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 um, because you're absolutely right. The military is interested in. Um, technologies, not for the sake of technologies, they're looking for capabilities um, to address problems and challenges that they have, um, and certainly within the medical space. And so I think a push strategy is very hard. Um, it can, I suppose, um, you know, yield success. But I think that, you know, that, um, you know, starting out with a, to begin to, um, uh, you know, have a relationship um, with the military, a collaborative relationship with the military in medical research, I think going to symposiums, going to events like this, um, mingling with uh, uh, folks from the military and really listening to what their needs are and then being very real about whether or not your technology uh, would you know, really have the ability to address those needs. Because if there is um, any type of misalignment there, I think that you're going to a probably run into challenges even initiating a project, but certainly over the course of the project, I you know um, it's it's success is going to be tough. Yeah, I guess I would just second that. I think most pe most scientists are familiar mostly with the NIH in the health sector, and the NIH is a, a science based um, organization, but the military tends to be a requirement based organization. Um, where they have specific needs and wants. And so understanding those are, is key as opposed to just um, taking whatever science that you have available and, and trying to, to push that. I think it's, it's important also to, if you get some fee good end user feedback on an alignment, it's, it's good to go a little bit deeper and broaden that a little bit to make sure that that's replicated as well. Make sure it's sort of not just one person that you've encountered, but in fact that you can replicate that need also, there's a kind of local local alignment, and then there's national and strategic alignment. So it's sometimes useful to look look at what the strategic priorities are of the of the DoD of the branch, and if you can kind of get your finger on the pulse of that, and that sort of aligns with the user needs. That's that's sort of the ideal formula is to make sure that that all aligns before you really spend because it's a big time and. Uh, both chronological time and then your personal time and effort to, to you know, to work on these grants and then to find out that you know this is just not going to work out. You could burn up two years of time and realize that maybe this is not going to go like I thought. So in our experience, we actually repurposed a product. Um, we developed a product for chronic wounds, and biofilms are a major issue in chronic wounds. Um, our product works has inter, uh, ingredients that work synergistically to break down the biofilms and then kill the microbes within it. And we saw this opportunity to use it on acute wounds uh, to prevent a biofilm. So we were able to repurpose the same technology and just um, change the application. Um, we're still working on that project. We don't know for sure that it's going to work, um, but so far all of the results have been good. So. Um, it does work both ways, but I think it's easier to start from scratch with a new idea based on their needs. We just were lucky that our product fit. I want to uh, take the opportunity to give uh, Dr. Scott Walter in the room here a plug because his group at the 59th Medical Wing puts out a monthly report of current uh, 
DOD military medical R&D funding opportunities. So, uh, and I, I send that out to everybody on the mailing list I maintain. So if you'd like to receive those, I'd be happy to add you to that mailing list. But it's a good way to know what the government is interested in funding these days. I mean, you can start at the top and look at, uh, you know, Defense Appropriation Act, you know, language and what, what the priorities are. But you can also start local and, and get information from, you know, what's actually being done here in San Antonio, who's working on what, and a lot of that can come from local resources like we have here in town. So I think that's quite valuable. And I know um, some of the people on the call today obviously have had military careers, but in my experience, um, a lot of people in the private sector <clears throat> haven't. And what I've learned over the last couple of years, is it really helps to have some advisors who are either retired military or in the military that they, they they know how these organizations are set up. They kind of talk the talk and they can frequently, if, if somebody gets an email from somebody who's a retired Lieutenant Colonel or a retired general, they'll get a lot quicker response than if it's coming from somebody who, you know, ha has none of those kinds of credentials. So, um, you know, I think anything, and, and uh, you know, I would ask the panelists to comment on this. I think you need to align yourself with people who are um, familiar with the structure and sort of how the system works. And I think it can vary from branch to branch as well. So. I'll open that up if anybody wants to comment on it. Yeah, I'd say it's been indispensable for us. Uh, we have a, a group of maybe 20 or more um, retired uh, service members from all branches who give us feedback on our products on a kind of regular basis. Um, and uh, having that feedback is very, uh, especially my engineers like it. Um, they uh, come in and a lot of times they'll talk about being shot at while using a device and having, or what, what if one of my hands is injured or something like that. And uh, especially our engineers are, that's a bit of a different world for them. And so they really like the feedback. And I think that goes into the development and is quite useful. Yeah, it's a, I, I think it's a, like folks have to realize it's a, you know, it's, oper it's a very unique environment, not just operationally, but technically, logistically. Um, for example, you have to really make things incredibly simple to use, incredibly small, very lightweight. I mean, there some of the challenges that you face in a hospital are just, it's just such a different set of circumstances and to have people align with that and to be knowledgeable about that will save you a lot of time and maybe money if you can get that insight quicker before you develop something that just is frankly not practical for, for use in the military environment. If, you're, if your device requires five steps that you have to know to how to use it, you might need to make, you might need to engineer to make it to two steps or one step that you need to really understand because you could put in, somebody might get it in their hands the first time in the field and there might not be a training session like you'd have in the hospital. So it's a very different environment and to have constant insight and constant feedback really save you a lot of time, a lot of money and make and make your technology more effective. The operating environments are quite different in the civilian world than the military world. So, you know, if you have a great widget that you think every medic could use in their backpack, you have to realize that if your device is gonna go into the backpack, usually something else has to come out because they can only carry so much, they only have so much space. Or if you have a, a smartphone based device, it's gonna be, intended to monitor something you know, in the field, um, bandwidth can be a big issue because everybody is sharing limited bandwidth and there are other things that take higher priority than perhaps the information you're trying to transmit. So I think it's key that you know you and the private sector really understand the environment in which your product is gonna be used. And I think a lot of people have a misconception on the private sector that if they're working with the military or developing a product for the military, things are somehow gonna go faster because the, the need is greater. But I think that's it's not true, and I'd like to get you all to comment on that. But I mean, what we've heard from the military is it's a lot easier to get your product approved in the civilian sector first, and then you know, and then come to us. So um, I, I'd like to ask you all to comment on, on that uh, perception that things can happen faster in the military. Maybe sometimes they do if you're working with special operations or something. But I think in general, it's probably not true. I, I, I'll say that I mean the developmental pro process for like a medical technology doesn't really necessarily differ from the civilian world to the military world. Uh, so I don't know that, as you say, things happen faster. It's really on the side, the company side that the things happen. 
Um, certainly the funding helps things ha happen faster, which is useful, but the developmental process, the regulatory process, et cetera, is the same on e for either side. And, and really the military aspect of things adds one slightly level, increased level of difficulty in that some, for some of the points you just made, Corey, that things need to be smaller weight and cube, easier to use, et cetera. So it, adds, it probably adds a little bit more time. I'll just add this. I don't know if this is the right place to interject, but one thing I've sort of come to realize is that this nexus of small business and DOD needs, et cetera, I'm not sure that a lot of uh, military members know how to leverage the processes that exist, like the SBIR process, to solve their challenges. Not only end users, of course, but even like pilot unit leaders don't know that we have this really big challenge. How can we get this solved? Um, I'm not sure they really realize that this, this process exists, what we're talking about, interestingly. So that, that's one of the learning points for me over the last couple of years is that, you know, and then reflecting back on my time in the military, I had no idea how I could, you know, you, you know utilize my the channel, existing channels to leverage small business to solve the challenge that we had. I didn't know how to, I didn't even know that was possible. else want to comment on that? So I can add, I'll say working with the DOD, the funding comes um, faster than SBIR, for example. Uh, the, the review cycle is faster and then the actual funding is faster. But um, navigating the system has been really challenging for us. Um, we're only on our second military funded um, grant. And the first one we are delayed because we're working through documentation and figuring out who we need to talk to to do certain things. Um, so that's been a major challenge for us. And the other part of it um, is the actual reporting with the DOD is um, we have quarterly or bi-monthly reports in comparison to like yearly or you know at the completion of a grant. So the reporting takes a lot more manpower um, to, to complete for, for our DOD grants. So those are um, a couple of things that you should know. But the second grant, we're, we're working with a foundation. Um, so they're supposed to facilitate some of these interactions with the military. Um, and hopefully um, that one will go a little bit more smoothly than the first one where we went on it on our own. <laughs> Yeah. I would just uh, add, I think it depends on what processes, um, you know, there are processes that can be sped up through the military. Um, we have one device with what's called breakthrough device designation from the FDA. Um, if your military sponsor um, wants to support you for that, that is one of the mechanisms of getting um, BDD or breakthrough device designation. Um, but it, it goes through the same process with the FDA that does speed up some interactions. Um, there's other parts that take a little bit longer. If you're going to do an animal study, um, there's what's called the Akira process, which um, takes a, a little bit more time to, to get an extra level of, of kind of regulatory clearance. The same thing for um, human studies. And um, if you're going to have a waiver for a consent study, um, those have additional requirements within the, um, the army as well. So um, there, it's a little bit of a mixed bag um, uh, of some things uh, potentially speeding some things up and other things um, maybe taking an extra level of, of regulatory review. Yeah, I'll just add a couple of comments here to myself. So uh, I think one thing to be aware of is, um, you know, frankly, uh, you know, the global environment and what our military is engaged in. So I can tell you this, that the military can act very quickly and uh, can move both technology, technology adoption along um, much quicker when we're at war. So if there's a major conflict going on, you know, the, the uh, money available and the urgency of the situation that occurred during, you know, the 2000s versus now, very significantly different. And so, you know, in the pre-hospital environment that we operate in, most of the innovations and technologies that are in the aid bag and they're in uh, various sets, kits and outfits that are being fielded, we're all fielded during that era. Um, in the decade or so since most of those conflicts have winded down, the military tends to go back into its more, um, let's just say, you know, 
bureaucratic process driven approach and the lack of urgency is there. So I think that's one thing to pay attention to. I mean, you have, if you have a technology or a capability that uh, has a very urgent need in the military, then it has the potential to move quicker, both from the funding standpoint, um, you can get your military sponsors involved. We had them involved very intimately with our relation, uh, uh, our interactions with the FDA. Um, and so it's, it really boils down to that sense of urgency. And so that's something to overall just sort of look for. The other um, comment I'd make is that uh, the military is a very, very big place. <laughs> uh, um, it is, there's no single person, there's no single branch, there's no single office, and they all operate a little differently. Um, you know, we had, uh, we were fortunate um, uh, and privileged to work with the folks in, US, in special forces primarily during the early stages of our development. Um, and that had a very different feel, both from a contracting standpoint, a funding standpoint, um, a, uh, uh, an overall development um, loop and urgency standpoint than it did maybe with other uh, offices within the military. So that's another thing to pay attention to is to, you know, what's your technology or your capability going to be used for? Uh, what branch and what office are you working with? And my guess is you're going to have a very different experience, perhaps, you know, other types of technologies working with different folks. Talked a little bit about how somebody in the private sector can become aware of what's being funded, what the priorities are. But another part of that is uh, identifying collaborators because having somebody on the inside of the military to basically uh, commit to helping you do whatever needs to be done to move your product along, whether it's a preclinical, an animal study, or a clinical trial, or whatever the work is, is going to be uh, is going to greatly facilitate what you're trying to do. So, one of the most frequent questions I get uh, in my role from companies is, who can I talk to about this? Who can I? If my product is this. Who can I talk to in the military that might be a potential collaborator? And myself, not being ex-military, not being in the military, I usually reach out to my friends who are in the military to point me in the right direction. But I'd like to know what y'all's thoughts are in terms of what your experience has been in terms of um, if you have a particular device or product that you want to bring closer to commercialization, how do you go about identifying who the right collaborator is that's going to help you apply for DOD funding or actually do the work that needs to get done to validate the concept and so forth? Anybody? For us, it's all been local networking, but we also work with a um, consortium to um, find the funding. And um, they have conferences where you can go and meet people. Um, same thing here, the, um, the conference that we're promoting. Um, it's important just to get out and talk to people and find those areas where there's common interest. So that's what's worked for us. about the rest of you, what have your experience has been, or how do you operate currently when you have something new for set that you want to bring forward? Well, I think, as I pointed out before, is establishing a network and, and having some folks that can reach back to their military context is absolutely key. It's really a, it's a tough environment to just go to the front gate and knock on the door and say, can I come in and you know, find the right end user? You really have to have a network and connection set up. And they start, if you don't, if you're just not retired from the military or, or don't have someone in your company who's that is starting at events like this and other events where they're both military and small business present, there are SBIR, SCTR conferences, et cetera. But you really have to find, you really have to set up a network to hone in on, you know, sort of the pilot unit or some unit that is involved in whatever it is you do. I mean, really that is, that is a key part of this whole process is establishing those connections and that pipeline of communication because you just it's just not a cold call environment it just simply isn't it's just not welcoming to that so that is absolutely foundational to this whole discussion is having a network yeah i'll i'll absolutely support that i think this is um it's it, it it's very much like i think you know um most situations in life where it's it's based on trust and sort of building trust with you know people and um uh, you know the military and again using that term broadly the people within the military that are responsible for um 
funding these projects and bringing capabilities um, uh, to to reality, um, you, you know, they have to they have to trust that the uh, small businesses or the research laboratories that they're funding are are going to um, you know progress the research, develop the technologies, um, you know, ultimately you know bring the capabilities forward, uh, and so. Just like any other human relationship, you you have to you know begin building trust, and that may start with somewhat of a cold call or a meet and greet at a scientific symposium or an event like this, uh, and then you just have to build it the old-fashioned way um, uh, by you know being persistent, um, showing results, starting starting with a small project that may lead to a bigger project, etc. Yeah. One other thing I'll, I'll I'll mention is so if you if you have it if you're in an academic environment, that that also allows for some additional levels of collaboration, especially if the academic institution that you're at has a has a connection, a military connection. Like at UT Health, we have the Military Health Institute. So let's say if you know someone at UT Health has what they feel is the military relevant relevant technology, that that channel could be easily opened by leveraging the Military Health Institute and helping allowing them to help you establish a communication. So I think more and more academic institutes are developing that sort of thing. Um, furthermore, Corey, I mean, if someone's in San Antonio, I would suggest, and they don't have a connection, the first place I would direct them is to you, <laughs> right? As a, as a, as a, as a conduit to, to find the right military connection. So, so those are two good resources, at least in San Antonio, uh, that I'm aware of if you have really no connection whatsoever um, is to start there. And it just as a pitch for our meeting, the morning, we haven't published the agenda yet, but the morning session is going to have updates from all three major branches, the Institute of Surgical Research in the Army, the Naval Medical Research Unit, the 59th Medical Wing, are all going to talk about what their priorities and capability gaps are currently. So for those of you that come to the meeting in April, I think you'll get a good overview of kind of who's working on what in town here. And I, I will also mention that there are, there's a big meeting that typically takes place in August called uh, MHSRS, which is the Military Military Health System Research Symposium. It was last held in 2019. Uh, in the pandemic, it didn't happen in 2020 or 2021. I think it's still going on in 2022, as far as I know, although they're not, it's not open for registration yet. But if you're interested in getting into this area, um, you should try and go to that meeting, perhaps. And uh, when they do open up registration, you can go to the website and, and sign up, so you'll be notified. But when they open registration, you better be ready to go because I think it, uh, the hotel where it is sells out pretty quickly and uh, it's good to go to. So, um, yeah, I guess, um, you know, for those people that are sort of trying to get their toe in the water, they're in the private sector, they have products, they're, they have development capabilities. You know, I wanted to give everybody on the panel a chance to perhaps share their learnings or give some advice to people that want to get into this area in terms of you know, how is working with the military an advantage and how, what are the challenges that come with that? And, you know, what would you advise people who are thinking of um, perhaps collaborating with the military that haven't done so yet? So, let's talk about that. Yeah, so overall, all of our experiences have been positive other than, as I mentioned before, learning how to navigate the system. So it's very different than NIH or NSF research it's very different than working with industry or academia. It's its own um, unique, uh, I guess, area. And every organization is different. So we have funding through the Navy and through the Army, and they're both completely different experiences. So um, I think that there is that level of um, understanding that you need to go in with that this is a little bit uh, more complex than other uh, grant funding. Um, but overall, um, our collaborations have been really fruitful. And um, I don't really have any advice other than what we've already mentioned is once you have um, that collaboration, it's just like any other re relationship, building the trust and um, I guess doing the things that you said you're going to do. So as long as you can complete the contract, um, it should um, help move these products forward and hopefully uh, make an impact with the, the warfighters.
Yeah, I guess I would add, I would second that and just say that, um, you know, in contrast to perhaps other grants or funders, depending on the, the funding level, as you go up the levels, um, you know, the military has many resources that they want your project to succeed. So they may have their own regulatory experts, um, their own engineers or clinicians that um, are all willing to, um, and, and scientists and researchers who, who can kind of add to the project um, as opposed to just being um, a one-way street. So I think the, the key part is listening to your, your funders and, and utilizing those um, frequently free resources that come with it um, to, to further the product. Um, and so I think that's a big benefit that is probably not seen in, in many other areas. Yeah, um, Corey, that's a really loaded question. <laughs> Where to start? Um, I think that, uh, you know, one aspect of working with the military that I found to be very helpful, and especially for a small business, is that it brings an immense amount of focus and discipline, okay? Uh, unlike where, um, you know, you, you draft a business plan and you may be taking money from angels or, you know, venture capitalists and, and um, you know, there's, there's clearly a strategic goal for the company and there's clearly a plan to do that with the military, you really got to be specific about it when you take on these these grants and contracts. They're going to have deliverables that you have to meet. A lot of that, um, the ideas in general, that gets mapped out. And so, you know, especially for a small company, it keeps you disciplined and focused on the end goal and the product development aspects of it. So I think that's one thing that can be, um, uh, you know, a real benefit. The challenge of working with the military, um, there's many um, on the contracting side. Um, the timing can be an issue. Um, sometimes contracting can move very quickly. You can find out that you're going to get an award. And I think the fastest we ever, you know, received notice that we're going to get funded and then two funding was something on the order of maybe eight weeks. That was extraordinary. More often than not, you get notice and then, you know, it's six, nine, 12 months later to actually getting a signed contract that you can start the work uh, and start getting paid for it. And so, um, and there's a whole host of factors that can go into that. Everything from when the congressional budget drops to the, you know, whatever's going on with that particular branch or that particular office. Um, and sometimes communication can be challenging on this level. So I think timing, timing of funding, timing of, so if you're a small business and you have a business strategy and, and, and you have operating costs and all this sort of stuff and you just want to go, go, go. And it's like, I, once I get the money, I'm, I'm gone and I want to do this. Um, with the military, it can be very stop and start um, based on sort of the contracting cycles. Um, so uh, that's an aspect that can also, you know, that, that can be pretty challenging for it. Um, but, you know, the discipline is great. The, the other challenging aspect is that um, what I found, and we've probably had 15, 16 contracts. I'm not up to where Ross is, but um, we're, you know, we've been through several awards. They're all different. Every contracting office is different. As soon as you think you know what you're doing, you don't know what you're doing. And what I've also found is that a lot of times the people in the military don't know what they're doing either. So um, it's an immensely complex system. The federal acquisition regulations and, and uh, all of the different systems, processes, rules, and regulations that govern all this um, are incredibly complicated. Uh, and so um, each time you take on a ward, it's, it's real, you know, it can be a new experience. And so I would say um, you definitely need to be adaptable. I'll leave it there. Thanks. Yeah, one thing was new for me was the military medical uh, research structure consists of people that are wearing uniforms that are kind of on the command side of things, and people that are wearing lab coats that are you know, doing the science, and there's a fairly regular turnover of the command people, the people in uniforms, whereas the people in the lab coats tend to stay there. Now, what they're doing from year to year may change depending on the priorities, but I mean, that can be a challenge too in terms of, you know, developing relationships and some of the people on the command side of things are more eager or motivated to establish collaborations with the private sector than others. So all that has to be taken into account. So it's, uh, it's a learning experience, as you say. Um, 
I don't know if anybody has general comments or we can also open it up to any questions we have in the room or questions online. I, I just wanted to bring up this concept of, um, uh, you know, and it is sort of a challenge is this so-called valley of death concept with regard to developing, you know, military medical technologies and whether or not they have dual use purpose is whereby you've, you've had a phase, maybe a phase one funding and then a phase two funding. And I'll, I'll just give an example of ours. You know, we had a direct to phase two for our, our procedural enclosure and we developed a really outstanding product uh, with, you know, uh, with a, that was basically had dual use. It had a, it was at the COVID in, enclosure where it had tremendous uh, particle evacuation performance. It fit on NATO litters. It had a standalone transportable pump. The feedback from our end users was that they really would like to see it utilized for, you know, just for, for not only for COVID, but for future, you know, future uh, uses if, if we have another pandemic of some sort. And, um, but it required some more regulatory and commercialization development that, you know, ex definitely far exceeded the cost of the, of the phase two funding. And, and really no one knows how to make that happen. Like, how do you then get the product the, that you've sort of validated from a technology point of view and user need point of view with a phase two, how do you get that to the market, especially if it's a medical technology that requires F more FDA regulatory stuff? And if it's a class two or class three device, even more. I mean, basically any gadget requires about, you know, roughly, this is conservative, three to $5 million really to get to market. And the process doesn't really account for that. So a lot of, a lot of technologies are developed that sort of sit on the shelf that require more funding for commercialization. And, and that, that's a big challenge. That's something to really be prepared to deal with um, if you haven't ever you know, been through this process. And because when you talk about, well, what is a phase three? I don't think really anybody really knows what that is. And the, and, and the military, they really don't know what that is. And I think in the military medical community, it's even tougher. Uh, if you develop a, you know, a grenade or something, and I'm sure that, you know, you've got it through phase two and it's almost ready to be used and it did require, you know, an FDA regulatory process and the front, the end user wants to buy it, they find the money to buy it. But in the medical and medical devices, it's different. It's a lot different. So that's a huge challenge. It's a, I've, 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 I read about it and then experienced it. So I'll tell you, it's, it's a big challenge. So I don't know if anybody else on the panel has any experience with that to add. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say, I think we've had, um, well, four or five gone on to the phase three award, um, and, or there is no phase three award, but where you get the, uh, the phase three money and, and take that next. And I think that gets to, I think that might've been Stephen's first point is that, or, or Andrew's that you, once you get in one realm, you don't necessarily know the other realms um, because there are so many different parts of, of the military. And so being able to connect that, uh, you know, a lot of people do start with the SBIR awards, which are a great mechanism, I think. Um, and, um, but you get a phase one and you think, okay, I'm gonna, this is gonna fund me all the way to the end. And, and yet it won't, it'll get you to that phase two. And then you're kind of left up in many ways to your own devices to, to kind of restart the process and say, okay, who are the funders for that next phase? Um, it's not all connected by itself. Um, and so it's kind of up to you as the company or the, the, the te technology to, to find that next step. Um, and it's a very difficult leap, which I think um, correctly noted is, is not um, straightforward. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's good to get in. And then once, once you're in, you have to kind of keep figuring out, okay, how am I going to learn that next process? Um, and, uh, but it's a bit of a process. Yeah, it may be that some of this non-dilutive SBIR funding is good at a certain stage of development where you really want to de-risk and show proof of concept. And then once you've done that, then maybe you got to sort of change horses, uh, try and find a different way to get, get it past that point. But, uh, <clears throat> I'll say, fortunately, in San Antonio, there are a lot of retired military people here, and there are people that have, have backgrounds in, on the mel military medical side, too. So I think if you're in San Antonio, in the private sector, and you're thinking of working with the military, there are probably people in town you 
connect with that could advise you or help you make connections. So I think that's a potential advantage. So, um, I'll, I'll, I'll ask if any of you all want to make any general comments before I open it up to questions and then things you wanted to get out there or make a point that you haven't had an opportunity to through the questions. Yeah, I'll just, I wanted to, I guess, further that last sort of um, topic regarding the Valley of Death. Um, I, I, I agree with um, Steve on this. It is, it is one of the biggest challenges, if not the biggest challenge. Um, and I think it, um, uh, you, you know, the, because we've been through the full life cycle, we've actually, in a sense, overcome it. We, we're not an R&D shop. We never were set up. We were set up to be an actual operational company. So when we took on our initial funding, um, we actually, you know, we looked the special forces teams in the eye that we were working with. And we said, we're going to get this device on the battlefield. Um, that was a bit of an, you know, at the time, probably a, a, a naive commitment, knowing everything that we would have to go through to do that. Um, but we were able to actually successfully do that, um, establish a, a manufacturing facility and get it through the FDA and deliver the device to the battlefield. Um, what I'll say about that journey is that the, um, just in a very high level, the, military research and development um, uh, offices and, and overall community is very different from acquisition and procurement, okay? And so the linkages between the two, I have found to be somewhat challenged, uh, especially in medical research and development. And what I mean by this is though, needs and capability gaps can be identified by the various research and development institutions in the, in the military it does not necessarily mean that if you fully succeed and develop the mousetrap that addresses the capability gap identified by those people and those uh, various offices and institutions within the military does not mean that when you go through that whole process that acquisition and procurement and budgeting and requirements and putting everything together on that end is completely synced up and linked up. And so, in other words, uh, the military, although it funds the development of the capability that you are developing, doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be a customer for the end use product. And I know that sounds um, uh, doesn't sound very logical and doesn't seem to make a lot of sense but we found that to somewhat be the case. And so I think an awareness about that heading in, it speaks to the question of whether your product should be dual use, uh, have a civilian use versus a military use. But frankly, a lot of the capabilities the military is asking for are specific to the military experience because if a commercial off the shelf device were available, they would just simply go buy it. And so they're looking for special devices for special needs or special technologies. And so, um, I think this is a, specific, a very challenging area, especially in the uh, uh, middle, uh, in medical research and development. And I, I frankly don't have a great solution. Um, we've been standardized. Uh, our products have been standardized uh, by um, certain operating units within the military, but um, we're still we're still working on uh, you know uh, um, broader acceptance and 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 working towards additional standardization and other branches and 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 units within the military. We have a few minutes left. If there are questions from within the room, yeah. or just a comment to, to both of the comments: one about keeping things simple and and to knowing your end user. One of the things to think about with you know, equipment is that you look at the end user being your medic, but the end user may be the guy that's standing beside the medic when he gets his hand blown off or worse yet goes down. So it has to be simple enough that best case scenario that medic can talk somebody through using the equipment. Two, it's simple enough they can read what's written on it and figure out how to use it themselves. So Connecting with who the potential end user may be beyond who you think it is is very important. I've had medics say, you know, it doesn't do any good if it's too complicated to be down the side. Of we have um, any questions online, Kate? Yeah, a couple questions online. The first one is 
how do you deal with the regular rotation of contacts since it takes time to develop a relationship with another person? That person moves on, you have to start over. How do you handle that? Y'all hear the question? Well, I can. Um, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Rebecca. Go ahead, Rebecca. You can. Um, I'm dealing with that right now, um, so we'll see how it goes. My the PI for our clinical trial is leaving San Antonio and going uh, to Ohio, so she has identified a replacement. Um, actually, two people that will be taking over as PI. Um, and hopefully that will be a smooth transition. So what we're planning to do is in the month of April, while she, they're both um, in place, is do a lot of training and, and transitioning all of the protocol over so the new PI has an understanding of the project. Um, but we'll see. <laughs> it's a very legitimate question. And uh, so that's why you have to have a little bit of depth to your relationship at the, you know, at the unit. And, and as, Dr., uh, as Corey was mentioning, if you could have relationships also with some of the civilian personnel who work either in the research office, uh, that's really useful because they typically have longevity, whereas the military folks have, not only do they have relatively rapid turnover when it comes to the life cycle of a device, but they also deploy a lot. And so that'll really throw a bit of a wrench into your into your, you know, into your milestone timeline or what have you. So you have to have some depth to the relationship, not just one person. Cause if it's all hinges upon one active duty member, you really, it's, it, there's some jeopardy to that. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is a persistent problem and something that you're gonna have to address if you sort of embark on this journey with the military, because if it's gonna take three, five, 10 years to get your capability to, to you know, there's no question that there's gonna be a significant amount of turnover over the folks that you're working with and collaborating with. I think the best defense against this is really strong alignment with, you know, a, a, again, an unmet need and you're developing a need. And so um, that's not tenuous, that's just, that's uh, very strong. The other thing is be a proven performer, be a great uh, uh, contractor for the military, um, do great work, meet your deliverables on time, communicate, communicate, and, and just be a great collaborator so that if the next person in the office picks it up, um, you know, and they get the debrief on how is it working with these folks, um, they're going to give you the positive, they're going to say, this is great, these guys are always on time, they're, they make my life easy that's going to that's going to bode well for you know you getting picked up and and sort of you know carry forward three more questions online or one more question online which is how would you go about getting an opportunity to pitch to relevant groups in the military about your technology i think for us it's the conferences so um the can't remember the acronym MHSRS. Um, there's abstracts open for that conference. Same thing for MTech. Um, if you're a member, you can have a poster at the MTech conferences. Um, going to uh, conferences like the one here in San Antonio. Um, that's been the way that we've made most of our our relationships. Anybody else want to address that? <clears throat> I think there's also local vendor days. I mean, if you're a company that has already approved products, and you're not looking for a collaborator. You're perhaps just looking for new markets for your products. I think the military here in San Antonio hosts vendor days where you can come and uh, display your wares and talk to people about the benefits of using your, your materials. So that's another way to do it. No more questions online? That's all the questions that are coming to the chat. Anybody else? Yeah, Roman. Uh, hi, uh, this is Roman Sandoval, CEO and founder of Alice and Zinc. Uh, we started in 2020 and uh, wanted to get some insights on, I guess, uh, you, had, you had answers regarding commercialization, so we use technologies, but frankly, how to work with both the commercial industry and also the DoD. So, uh, Quick question is, what is your distribution regarding working in the industry and also defense contracts, whether they're like IDIQ, Super, or, or whatnot in the for laws 13 or OTA uh, domain? 
and also what is your general fundraising strategy uh, to sustain as a business, knowing that sometimes uh, the contract vehicles do take some time to, uh, to get some revenue. Okay, so first one, because we have no contracts military yet in terms of actual product of market. Anybody else want to address any of those questions? There's a number of questions there, but I'll just touch upon the, the funding question, you know, especially with regard to sort of military contracts and aligning that with um, uh, other sources of funding that especially a startup would need. Um, this is something else to sort of keep in mind too, is that if you're going down the path of starting a company that's either, um, you know, focused on military-based products or um, has a lead product, it's a significant part of the overall strategy that's something you're going to have to keep in mind as well as you look to other sources of funding in terms of whether you're going out to the private markets and looking at angel or venture funding, uh, or if you're in a more at stand straight private, uh, private equity type sources of funding. Um, you got to make sure that they understand that military market, that they're comfortable with the risks associated with that market and the likelihood of your success in the market with the military ultimately being a customer um, for your products. And so when you hit that commercial stage and so um, again, you're, you know, a typical uh, venture capital uh, company that funds consumer-based products can be very different from, you know, um, looking at your business strategy, which is, I'm going to be relying on the U.S. military as my lead customer for this product. And so the types of relationships, the credentials, what your product is, the, the unmet need, the volume, and all that sort of stuff, sort of something you have to take into account because um, it may or may not be you know, it could be easier or more challenging to raise money depending on those factors from other sources beyond your military contracts. And in our experience, there will likely come a time, I think it was, you know, Ross or Steven that indicated at some point you got to graduate from, well, this isn't research and development anymore, you know, phase two, phase three, phase whatever, it's commercial stage. And when you hit that stage, the military rarely uh, um, uh, funds commercial activities like that. And so you're going to have to go buy your first, you know, batch of inventory. You're going to have to go buy the equipment you need to make it. You're going to have to go figure out how to sort of fund all that activity and go commercial um, and manage cash flows and sort of all that until you can make your first shipments to the military. And so likely that's going to require some additional outside sources of funding, unless you're an established business and sort of can fund that internally. But um, that's that that has to also get you know pulled together in, into an overall cohesive business strategy to deliver the product to the market and deliver it to the battlefield. One other strategy uh, here, if you you know, because as as uh, Andrew pointed out, it's very expensive to do the things you just said. So another thing you could leverage an SBAR in phase one and phase two for is to completely de-risk a technology that you've also established a tremendous user need for. And then once you've done that, then you can look towards commercial partners or commercialization partners to, to help you bring their, your, your product to market, both through their manufacturing and their distribution. So that becomes a, an attractive method, but you have to position your technology to make it almost sort of irresistible, if you will, to commercial to commercialization partners, if you don't want to start your own manufacturing and distribution company, which certainly there's not enough meat on the bone, so to speak, in the SBR world to do those kind of things. Or you have to take private money to do those things. Those are really the only routes. Our company, we have basically uh, take a, basically split strategies and, and now are becoming a distributor for other, other medical technologies to really fund our R&D and commercialization aspect of our business. So that's the, that's the path we're choosing as opposed to taking private equity for our multiple technologies right now. Okay, well, um, we're about five minutes past the hour. Um, I wanna thank the panelists today for being here. I think um, every one of these meetings has gone over the time allotted, which is a good sign, I think it means People are curious and want to hear more about it. So I would say if that's the case, please register for the meeting on April 19th. 
and uh, these and other topics will be discussed at that meeting. And um, again, I want to thank all the panelists for being with us today. I think it's been a very interesting educational hour. So um, I want to thank you all. So let's thank the panelists for us. Thank you for the philosophy. Thanks for hosting us. Appreciate it. Bye, y'all. <laughs>